We present Kenneth Williams, Peter Jones, Clement Freud and Kenny Everett in just a minute. And as the minute waltz fades away, here to tell you about it is our chairman, Nicholas Parsons. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello and welcome to Just a Minute. And as you've just heard, we welcome uh, for the very first time on the program as our guest to play with our three regulars, we have Kenny Everett. The other three are so familiar with the game that I won't mention their names again, but uh, just remind everyone that they're going to try and speak if they can for just a minute on the subject that I will give them, and they're going to try and do it without hesitation, repetition, or deviating from the subject on the card. We begin the show this week with Peter Jones, and the subject, Peter, to start with is the Mexican hat dance. <laughs> Would you tell us something about that in just a minute, starting now? Yes, it's an interesting, amusing dance. You need a Me Mexican hat <laughs> to do it properly, and you put that down on the floor, and you dance round it, flexing your muscles. Uh, Kenneth Williams has challenged. I've got a hesitation there. Yes, I would agree with you, Kenneth. There was a hesitation, and so you gain a point for a correct challenge. You take over the subject, and there are 47 seconds left. The Mexican hat dance starting now. This is based down to the accompaniment of Tintin Abulation. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I... I... <laughs> I fell for it. Uh, uh, I thought it was a repetition of tin, but yes, it was. It was right. a lovely use of the word. Very, very nice. Yes, and so it was an incorrect challenge. Definitely. So Kenneth <laughs> has a. And I would an... like to apologise. I wouldn't apologise. Just... <laughs> no, I just mean I would like to apologise. Well, you have apologised. No, I haven't. You show that you listen I very acutely. <laughs> Excuse me, are you and uh, uh, Clement starting a spin-off? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think Kenneth uh, Williams, from the look of him, has spun off already. So we'll <laughs> get on with the contest. And there are um, 44 seconds left, and you still have the subject, Kenneth. Uh, the Mexican hat dance starting now. To the music of the romantic guitar, and a lady nearby with an eye patch on and the castanet. You can do the Mexican hat dance until you are... Uh, Kenny Everett has challenged. Ham. I thought it was hammy. <laughs> I thought it was getting hammy a bit. Absolutely right, it, it was. What do you mean, yeah. absolutely right? <laughs> That's not one of the rules of the game. You of course that. You don't I can still agree again. with my friend Kenny, even if it's not one of the rules of the game. I didn't say I was going to give him the challenge. Oh, I was okay. agreeing with him. <laughs> oh. I mean, you all know I'll what... come back all I say. <laughs> Oh, I am omelette sur les visages. Wow, you enjoy, you enjoy being called That's a ham. That's French egg on your face. <laughs> Kenny, I agree with you. A delicious bit of ham, but you're allowed to ham it up as much as you wish. He gets another point, keeps the subject. Mm. 32 seconds, the Mexican hat dance starting now. When this was last performed in front of a very distinguished ambassadorial audience in Mexico City, two spectators were heard to say, What about all that sweat? because it is very energetic when you're doing the Mexican hat dance. And somebody else said, why don't you use mum? Which, of course, isn't heard of out there. It means absolutely nothing. And they said, over here, you don't use those expressions. You should keep mum and not... <laughs> and come and for this child. What happened then? <laughs> it's really marvellous. I have a go and it's ruined every mm. time. Two mums. Yes, a repetition of the word and a repetition of advertising. Oh, sorry. Yes, so, uh, Clement, you got him with the correct challenge with four seconds to go, the Mexican hat dance, starting now. It's not something I do terribly well, although I frequently try... Well, when Ian Messeter, the great inventor, sitting beside me, blows his whistle, it tells us that 60 seconds is up, and whoever is speaking at that moment gains an extra point. It was um, Clement Freud. So at the end of the first round, Clement has two, <laughs> Kenneth has three, and our other two have yet to score. Clement Freud, uh, will you begin the next round? The subject is cellars. Can you tell us something about those in just a minute, starting now? Cellars tend to be deep, dark dungeons in which people keep wine, if they don't have bottles under the stairs or in their refrigerators. The ideal cellar for Burgundy is kept at a steady temperature of 62 degrees Fahrenheit, which I'm sure has an equivalent in both centigrade and Réaumur, which I'm not able at this moment to conjure up. Peter Sellers once had a house in Hampstead which was on the market, 
And when I auditioned for Diana Rama... Uh, Kenny Everett has challenged. Do you, uh, what do you call it when you go off the subject? A deviation. Yes. Uh, and that well, was... How in what way do you think he was deviating? Well, he went from Sellers to a house in Hampstead or something, do you think? Yeah, but it was Sellers' house in Hampstead. And he was see. selling it. And he was... And he was selling it. <laughs> because we, look, we, we looked at it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, if you walk right into that, you did. <laughs> Thanks for challenging, Kenny. It's good to hear from you. But alas, it was the wrong challenge. Uh, Clement has another point, and there are 19 seconds left on cellar starting now. Caveat emptor is an expression no one should be without, meaning, as it does, let the buyer beware. And sellers, being iniquitous as they are, try to get the best deal to the enormous detriment of they who purchase, or them if Kenneth Williams is the grammarian. So Clement Freud started with the subject of sellers and with tremendous ingenuity on the subject kept going. For the 60 seconds with one interruption, he is now in the lead at the end of that round. And uh, Kenneth Williams, will you begin the next round? The subject is dealing with difficult people. Something of which I have great experience sitting where I am now, but, Kenneth, will you talk on the subject starting now? Well, this requires a degree of both diplomacy, tact, and I think a little psychology is indicated. For instance, those who so often are dubbed difficult are, in fact, the most complacent when it comes to acting actually undertaking the task for which they are fittest. And in all my long and distinguished and varied career, I have invariably found those who have been so late... Uh, Peter Jones has challenged... Well, that's marvellous, isn't it? <laughs> now, what's wrong now? A repetition of those. Yes. Oh, well, if you're going to pick it around with little words like that, well, it comes to your turn. You just wait, mate. You wait for <laughs> right, well, we'll wait for that it. because Peter is at last going to have a turn. He's got a point for a correct challenge. And there are 23 seconds left, Peter, on dealing with difficult people starting now. I think the ideal situation is when one is coping with someone who is rather mercurial, someone who is unreliable. Uh, Clement Freud? Repetition of someone. Yes, there was, I'm afraid, Peter. Oh, yes, there was. There yeah. are 13 seconds for dealing with difficult people, Clement, starting now. I have spent many years trying to deal with Kenneth Williams, <laughs> and I wish I knew how. Uh, uh, Kenny Everett has challenged. There was a big long pause. There, there was a hesitation, Ke Kenny. No, so I you stopped. Got now. You have a... <laughs> it was a short statement. So, Kenny, you've got your first point, and you've got your first subject. One point! Ah! And it is, and only four and a half seconds to talk on it, dealing with difficult people, starting now. I tend to find the best way to avoid difficult people is to walk in the opposite direction! So Kenny Everett was speaking then as the whistle went, so he got that extra point. He's now in third place, uh, just ahead of Peter Jones. Clement Freud's still in the lead, and Kenneth Williams is in between them. <laughs> Where else is the place for Kenneth to be? Kenneth, uh, uh, Kenny, Kenny Everett, uh, will you begin the next round, please? The subject is a nice one, yes, the ghost at the BBC. Oh, I, I think tell probably something about that. 60 seconds starting oh. now. Uh, I think, uh, what? Uh, Kenneth, <laughs> Hesitation. Never! <laughs> yes, there was a hesitation, but I'm not going to allow it, because he did start. I don't think he realises, and he has to wait for me to say now, because that's when um, M.S. presses the... Oh, I see. How benign. <laughs> <laughs> the subject is the ghost of the BBC. You start when I say now. I will tell you that there are 58 seconds, and you start now. I think probably that I am the ghost of the BBC, because I was there a very long time ago, about ten years, and, you know, they do uh, say... Kenny Williams. Hesitation. No. <laughs> Kenny, you have a point. <laughs> Thank you. An incorrect challenge, you have 50 seconds on the ghost of the BBC starting now. And I got the boot, you see, and they do say that on dark, dreary nights as the rain is swinching up against Broadcasting House... Um, Peter Jones, a challenge. I can't allow swinching. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's 
rather like a wet woman walking the street. <laughs> but uh, what is your actual challenge, Peter? Um, deviation. Of what? From correct English, of course. Yes. <laughs> But he was not deviating. Hey, listen. <laughs> Peter, he may have been deviating from correct English, but he wasn't deviating from the subject on the card. Kenny, you still have the subject, okay. and there are 42 uh, two and a half seconds on the ghost of the BBC starting now. As the rain is swenching up. Uh, Peter Jones, the <laughs> Repetition of swenching. <laughs> Yes, I quite agree with that one. That is the correct challenge, Peter. There are 41 seconds now for you to talk about the ghost at the BBC starting now. The ghost at the BBC must be Sir John Reith. And he must be very unhappy indeed when he hears these... Uh, Kenny Williams... Two must-bees. Yes, you've got back at him on the those and the must-bees. There are 33 seconds on the ghost at the BBC. Kenneth Williams starting now. The phrase, the ghost of the BBC, is in itself a lie, since we all know that no such thing exists, so therefore you couldn't have anything wandering about wraith-like down the corridors of the BBC or... Uh, <laughs> Kenny Everett. Two BBCs. Yes, but it's on the cards. On the cards, you great nit. <laughs> 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 Don't take any of that stick from him, can you? Get back at him. No, it, it, any word or the phrase on the card can be repeated, so we won't charge any points that he didn't know, and Kenneth Williams keeps the subject. I've seen a lot of wraiths wandering the corridors of the BBC, and uh, there are four... How many? Oh, um, yes, there are 18 seconds left, starting now. Mr Parsons maintains he's seen a lot of wraiths in the BBC. Now, that is to say, the wraith is... Um, Clement Freud. Repetition of race. Yes, yes I know all that, but the wraith is... <laughs> I'm going to say, you great fool, the wraith is in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> you see, that's all I'm going to say. I can get it out. Anyway, I quit that because you'd say, I suppose to you, you see. It's hardly worth getting out, really. No, right? that's true. <laughs> uh, Clement... There are six seconds on the ghost of the BBC starting now. Since we're all nominating different ghosts of the BBC, I would like the audience to bear in mind Mrs. Dale, who... <laughs> Kevin Troy, speaking as the whistle went, gained the extra point and has increased his lead at the end of the round. Peter Jones, will you begin the next round, the subject, How to Make an Umbrella? Can you tell us something about that in 60 seconds, starting now? Well, it's not necessarily as forbidding a task as it may sound, because it doesn't have to be made of metal and silk or nylon. You can use an umbrella that's made of, say, a rhubarb leaf. Uh, Kenny Everett has challenged. Two maids. Yes, it's right, Kenny. Well, listen, 47 seconds left for you to talk about how to make an umbrella starting now. If I were to be asked to make an umbrella, I think I would make it in a way that no one has ever done so before, without the spiky bits on the end, because there's nothing so annoying as walking along a rain-swept sweet street with the rain squenching up against the walls. <laughs> poke you in the eye with a spiky bit off the end. Uh, uh, Peter Jones, a challenge. Repetition of spiky. Yes. Let uh, alone squenching. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was in the other round. I know, but he repeated it in this round. I know. <laughs> He'll probably repeat it in the next one if he finds he gets such a good reaction every time. Uh, there are 27 seconds left, Peter, with you. How to make an umbrella starting now. So take some flat material, like a piece of plywood, and make a hole in it. Stick a... <laughs> <laughs> Clement Roy. Uh, hesitation. Yes. I think I've got to stick in the bit of plywood. So, 20 seconds are left on how to make an umbrella, Clement, starting now. Really almost anything which can be placed between you and the elements would qualify for the term umbrella, whether it's a banana leaf, a piece of silk, or corrugated iron, if you like, provided the rain which comes from above stops from hitting below via some impet... <laughs> Oh. <laughs> Clement Freud again was speaking as the whistle went. Again has increased his lead, and the other three are 
trailing somewhat, but very close together. Clement Freud, the, uh, will you begin the next round? The subject, Tom, Dick and Harry, 60 seconds, starting now. Dick and Harry were American presidents, and Tom is as yet not. It is an extraordinary thing that the citizens of the United States, who number 220 million, have this extraordinary facility for electing second-rate, mediocre people to govern them. <laughs> They're awfully nice, but when it comes to going to the polls and putting your cross or tick against one or other name which is suggested, it is an art form, I believe, to end up with unsuitable people. I hope this program does not go out <laughs> in those of our former colonies where what I've said will be accepted with resentment. Tom, Dick and Harry, in common parlance, are ordinary So Clement Freud started with the subject and finished with the subject, no interruptions, which is quite an achievement these days, and they know the game so well. And he gets uh, a point for speaking as a whistle, went an extra one for not being interrupted, and has increased his lead at the end of that round. Kenneth Williams, will you begin the next round? The subject, John Napier. Will you tell us something about him in just a minute, starting now? The entire Napier family produced some extraordinarily brilliant and renowned figures. But John Napier, if I've got it right, is the 17th century one who invented logarithms and wrote an extraordinary book on Joan of Arc and explain the entire theory behind the hallucinatory visions which she maintained she had. Uh, Kenny Everett has challenged. Two she's. Yes. <laughs> Uh, that is a correct challenge. Um, we don't always bother with that, but um, I must be fair. <laughs> <laughs> what? And, um, so you have 32 seconds to talk on John Napier starting now. But I will probably only fill about seven of those seconds because John Napier is a complete stranger to me. I think I should hand the whole subject back to Kenneth starting now. <laughs> And uh, Kenny Everett has challenged. What is your challenge, Kenny? Well, he paused Hesitation. after I said no. A now. very good yes. challenge indeed. <laughs> to me. So, Kenny Everett, who challenged himself, gets a uh, point for uh, hesitation because it was a correct challenge. He keeps the subject, which you now want to hand back to Kenny Williams. So, Kenny, if you have the subject gratis from. Um, uh, Kenny Everett, and there are 17 seconds on John Napier starting now. His great book entitled The True Revelations of the Aforementioned Saint. You will note I have not been repetitive. Rather clever of me. Uh, Peter Jones has challenged. A deviation. Yes. It was going off about being repetitive. Yes. Nothing to do with John Napier. No. And being clever yourself. Nothing to do with John Napier. <laughs> Absolutely true. Yes, but I know all about the man. He doesn't. He's an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> you wait till you find out. Ask him. Go on. It strikes me that, according to you, everybody here has an idiot. That's right. Himself. And he's right. <laughs> he's right. I am your one literate. That's why I'm on this thing. <laughs> and I, I, apart from Freud, young Clement Freud here, he's quite good. <laughs> the rest are all rubbish. Right. So, uh, Peter, join the gang um, uh, um, of rubbish, and you have three seconds, having got him with a good challenge. Three seconds! I will have called you a win. I know I did it. Down to three. He's not oh, such rubbish now, is he? Oh, he's clever, and he's <laughs> three seconds. Peter Jones, John Napier, starting now. The town of Napier in New Zealand, which was. <laughs> At the end of our round, Clement Freud is in the lead. Kenny Everett, our guest, is in second place now. Peter Jones and Kenneth Williams are just behind Kenny Everett. And Kenny, will you How begin... How come he's last if he's so clever? <laughs> <laughs> Intellect isn't always commercial.
Oh, the saying of the week. Um, <laughs> Kenny Everett, uh, your lovely subject that MS has thought of you to start the next round. My eccentricities, will you talk about those in just a minute, starting now? Well, I would like to hear from Ian what he thinks my eccentricities are, because I consider myself to be one of the saner members of society. The only real eccentricity I have and do possess is to shut myself away in a studio for days on end with coffee being flung under the door in great squanches as I make... <laughs> The world's most greatest jingles in the world. And you know, you haven't challenged world twice. <laughs> he has now. Peter? I was just trying to picture this coffee being flung <laughs> under the door. <laughs> and I wondered how you'd do it. Yeah. Slung, actually. Oh, slung under the door. Slung under the door. Yes. Not in there. If you'd had him for repetition of the world, which he gave you and didn't pick up. I know. Well, I didn't want to accept charity. <laughs> So, it's a wrong challenge. Kenny Everett has another point and keeps the subject. 35 seconds of eccentricities starting now. And the lights burn deep into the night as I face the microphone and put on a silly piece of music and jingle away to it, thinking of all sorts of daft words to put onto the wireless, you know, advertising various programmes uh, and what? Um, Peter Jones' challenge. A repetition of various. Yes. There are 21 seconds, Peter, for you on the subject, starting now. Well, my eccentricities are not very well known, and I've no intention of publicising them on this show, because I think it might cause embarrassment to my family and to some of the, my fellow artists, if I may call them that, who are at the present time uh, working with me. Uh, you see, eccentricities uh, can... <laughs> Well, Peter Jones was just, and only just, I think, speaking as the whistle went. <laughs> he got, <laughs> got an extra point for doing so, and um, he's still in third place. Uh, Kenny Everett's still in second place, Clement Freud's still in the lead, and Kenneth Williams is still where he was before. <laughs> uh, Kenneth, will you begin the next round? The subject is strings. Will you tell us something about those in just a minute, starting now? These are invaluable for kite flying. They are the means by which you can control the lovely thing as it sails loftily among the azure blue and the pearly clouds. Oh, with what joy you can behold the strings sailing away there. <laughs> But of course there are strings which people say are pulled in the sense of influence. And they say, yes, how does she get where she got? On her money. Yes. <laughs> you strings pulled there, weren't they, dear? Hey? Look at her. And of course this often happens. Uh, Clement Freud, a challenge. Of course. Mm, of course. The subject is strings. There are 21 seconds left starting now. The most interesting aspect of pulling strings is that when you tug, you have no idea of what is at the other end, provided the string is of a length exceeding 25 yards and your eyesight is of the quality of mine and you're not wearing glasses. I remember very vividly my daughter Emma... Herman Freud has again increased his lead, speaking as the whistle when gaining an extra point as well as others, and we now come round to Kenny Everett to start the subject. And the subject is marbles. Kenny, will you tell us something of those in 60 um, seconds, starting now? Marbles is a game that I last played when I was at St. Bede's Secondary Modern School for aspiring twits. And I always used to wonder, as I got my thumb into the marbleizing position, about to flick and ruin all the others in the circle, I used to wonder how the heck they got those little coloured squirrely bits to go through the glass. You know, the... 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 <laughs> And anyway, um, <laughs> I just wonder whether they put them in after with a hypodermic or whether they built the glass around the coloured squirrely and how they got all the colours all to intertwangle with each other, all sort of mangling and tumbling in a gay band and throughout the glass. That's what I used to wonder. And then I'd flick them and in the middle of the circle they'd go scattering all the other marbles in all various directions from east to west and north and probably south as well. And all the other kids would, would rush around saying, what a wonderful holly player the old geezer is because they used to call them 
hollies as well, you know, and they used to call them other things. Uh, but I've forgotten what the other things were that they used to call them, because I was very young at the time, <laughs> and I'm 34 now, it's been absolutely ages since I was at school, and so I've forgotten the whole thing. And anyway, it was the coloured squirrelies that caught my eye, really, because I had a great uh, eye for coloured squirrelies, and I think I've done much more than a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm afraid we were very wicked. We let Kenny Everett go on talking for 90 seconds on the subject <laughs> of marbles. Uh, during that time, he continued, repeated himself, deviated, and also hesitated. I didn't lose his marbles. <laughs> and neither did our three regulars. They didn't lose their marbles. They let him have Kenny have his full marbles because it was going to be the last round in the contest and how fittingly that our guest should finish it with such style and such panache. Yeah. God. And let me now tell you the final score. Uh, Kenny Everett, coming from nowhere, and... <laughs> <laughs> I'm going straight back there. <laughs> Finished up in third place alongside Kenneth Williams, and where better place to finish than alongside Kenneth Williams. They were behind Peter Jones, who was quite a few points behind. This week's winner, once again, Clement Freud. Congratulations to our guest for the marvellous way he played the game against the regulars who know the rules so well. They don't know the rules, they know how to play it. And congratulations to all of them, and particularly our audience who've enjoyed it all, because we've enjoyed playing the game, and we hope that you want to tune in again at the same time next week, when once again we'll all be playing just a minute. Till then, from all of us here, goodbye. The chairman of Just a Minute was Nicholas Parsons. The programme was devised by Ian Messiter and produced by David Hatch. <laughs> <laughs>